Hello and welcome to video 5 in a series of 10 produced for the reveal project and in this video we are going to focus on freedom of expression and libraries. The reveal project stands for reinforcing ethics and values for effective advocacy for libraries and it was funded by the Celebs Research Fund. The aim is to enhance collective advocacy across the profession through an accessible framework for library and information ethics and values presented as a set of continuing professional development tools and these videos form part of the training materials. The themes of the videos as you can see are various and cover advocacy, ethics, ethical theories as well as specific concerns related to libraries themselves. As I said this is the fifth video and it focuses on freedom of expression. The videos are all designed to be standalone, so if you want to look at all 10 videos, that's great. But equally, you can just dip in to the specific subjects that interest you. So beginning our discussion of freedom of expression. Now it's important to understand that freedom of expression and freedom of access to information are very closely aligned rights. Indeed, the International Federation of Library Associations has a special interest group, FAFE, which stands for Freedom of Access to Information and Freedom of Expression. And they state that the advisory committee is at the heart of IFLA's efforts to promote intellectual freedom and achieve the vital mission of supporting libraries in their role as gateways to knowledge and ideas. So really important to understand this then, freedom of expression is often used as a catch-all phrase, as we'll discuss in a second. But really, when we talk about freedom of expression in libraries, we're also talking about freedom of access to information. It's logical that the ability to seek out information on a topic of interest is a major component of a citizen's intellectual freedom, because if they're interested in a subject, they should be able to find out information on that subject. So access is vital. As Warburton argues, all human beings have an interest in being allowed to express themselves and in having the opportunity to hear, read, and see other people's free expression. As I said a second ago, freedom of expression often becomes a catch-all umbrella phrase for topics like free speech, as well as the right to seek out the ideas of others, as well as concerns around self-censorship, whereby an individual may seek to keep quiet on a topic or not seek out a book or another form of information for fear of being judged or criticised or worse. So when we see people talk about freedom of speech and freedom of expression, we need to consider it in the round in its totality, which includes all of these different aspects as well. And this leads us to the topic of equity of access. Equity of access means that everyone deserves and should be given the recorded knowledge and information she wants, no matter who she is and no matter in what format that knowledge and information is contained. And that's a quote from Michael Gorman. So therefore it's incumbent on libraries to make access to information resources as seamless as possible and to not restrict access to information unless compelled to do so for legal purposes. A Sillip state in their notes explaining the ethical framework. Access to information via libraries should not be restricted on any grounds but the law, and the legal basis of any restriction should always be stated. Now this is obviously an important ideal, but this ideal is essentially where a lot of the tensions related to freedom of expression in libraries lie, because ultimately Something may well be legal, but it may well also be offensive to individuals or groups who are not happy that the library stocks that particular item or range of items. So what are some of the defences put forward for freedom of expression? So we'll begin with defences and then we'll focus on critiques. So as a starting point, it's important to note that the notion of freedom of expression encompasses several important ideas. Forming opinions, expressing opinions, and being able to access information that helps you be informed are inherently related concepts. Barrett defines some core defences frequently used to justify the protection of free speech. And these can be summarised neatly as firstly, the argument from truth, secondly, the argument from autonomy, and lastly, the argument from democracy. The argument from, from truth is closely associated with John Stuart Mill's approach to freedom and on liberty. And Campbell summarises this as such. We cannot deny currency to any expression of opinion without reducing the efficiency of the knowledge market. Campbell also suggests it can be classified as a consequentialist justification for freedom of speech, focusing on societal benefits 
rather than individual rights. However, Barron argues it can also be seen as an autonomous and fundamental good in itself. According to Mill, truth is justified belief, and this justification is only valid when ideas and viewpoints have been thoroughly tested through argument and debate within society. Suppressing freedom of expression on a topic assumes the falsehood of an opinion before it is even heard, which is an epistemological mistake. Therefore, all perspectives, even false ones, should be allowed as they contribute to the quest for truth. Mill argues that no one has the authority to decide for all mankind and exclude others from judging their views. And for Mill, even if we are certain of the error of an expressed viewpoint, stifling it would still be an evil. So that's the argument from truth. And obviously it's one that has had lots of critiques about it, as we'll see, but it is one that a lot of people who classify themselves as liberals in the philosophical sense would use to justify freedom of expression. The argument from autonomy is based on the concept that freedom of expression is a fundamental right for individuals to achieve their potential as human beings. It's a prominent justification of free speech from a liberal and freedom standpoint, valuing speech for its own sake rather than its indirect results to society. However, this justification may be seen as contradictory to consequentialist arguments as it does not consider the impact of free speech on wider society. And obviously that's something you might see posited as an argument against it in libraries. This idea that just because someone wants to access a piece of information or a book, um, yes, you could argue their autonomy should be respected and they should be able to read that item. But ultimately, it may be something that others deem to be bad for society. So again, inherent tension in argument from autonomy is there. Barrett suggests that restrictions on speech can inhibit our personal growth as human beings. And this justification also intersects with other fundamental human rights, such as the rights to freedom of religion, thought and conscience. However, the argument from autonomy can lead to clashes between one person's right to freedom of speech and another's right not to be insulted or defamed. So again, argument from autonomy is an argument for free speech you will see quite prominently, but it's one that can have arguments against it from a wider societal benefit point of view. Lastly, the argument for democracy is built on the notion that in a democratic state, access to information and the ability to seek out opinions and express opinions is crucial in being able to hold governments to account. And I quote here from Warburton. In a democracy, voters have an interest in hearing and contesting a wide range of opinions and in having access to facts and interpretations, as well as contrasting views, even when they believe that the expressed views are politically, morally or personally offensive. So again, an acknowledgement here from Warburton in terms of this argument that you will be exposed to information that you may not like, you may find offensive in, in various ways, as he says, politically, morally or, or, or personally offensive. But ultimately, democracy benefits from that because it means that bad ideas get tested out. So what are some of the critiques of freedom of expression then? More contemporary concerns suggest that the autonomy of the individual can be incumbent on her cultural or religious group background being respected, even to the extent that access to any expressions against said background should be limited in the public sphere. And this applies to materials that may be said to demean the group in question through blasphemy, satire, or at the extreme end, instances of bigotry or hate speech. Now, Cohen has argued that this replaced Mill's harm principle with an offence principle, which held that societies are allowed to punish speech that people find exceptionally offensive. And there is a notion of freedom of expression or freedom of speech as a potential harm. And here, quoting Warburton, it says, Liberty should not be confused with license. Complete freedom of speech would permit freedom to slander, freedom to engage in false and highly misleading advertising, and freedom to publish sexual material about children, freedom to view state secrets, and so on. So it's very important to acknowledge that unrestricted free speech can be a form of harm. So Levin gives the examples of child pornography or hate speech. These are not things that societies necessarily wish to encourage. So again, here the tension is between arguing, especially when it comes to things like hate speech or offensive content, what are the legal limits on that? So intellectual freedom, therefore, can be one of the most challenging rights to uphold in terms of advocacy for libraries, since freedom of expression can also entail people wishing to express opinions that many in society may find offensive 
and may seek to access such views via library resources. So tensions then. One approach of the kind suggested by Warburton is popular, and I quote here from him. Commitment to free speech involves protecting the speech that you don't want to hear, as well as the speech that you do. Nevertheless, there are limits placed on freedom of expression, and where these limits sit can be one of the most contested aspects of the human right. And again, quoting Warburton here. There are foreseeable and dangerous consequences of many types of expression. There are cases where other factors may be more important than free speech, where national security is seriously threatened, for example, or where there is a risk of serious harm to children. Many people are prepared to restrict freedoms of speech to some degree for the sake of other ends. And again, this is logical. The idea that someone's right to access information or express their views could conceivably harm another human being. That's an important one to consider, balancing the rights of different people. So what are the restrictions on the right then? Although you have freedom of expression, you also have a duty to behave responsibly and to respect other people's rights. Public authorities may restrict this right if they can show that their action is lawful, necessary and proportionate in order to protect national security, territorial integrity or public safety, prevent disorder or crime, protect health and morals, protect the rights and reputations of other people, prevent the disclosure of information received in confidence, maintain the authority and impartiality of judges, and an authority may be allowed to restrict your freedom of expression if, for example, you express views that encourage racial or religious hatred. However, the relevant public authority must show that the restriction is proportionate, in other words, that, that it is appropriate and no more than necessary to address the issue concerned. So quite a wide range of areas where freedom of expression can be restricted, but equally importantly, the law is the main arbiter there. So it becomes potentially perilous for libraries to make the decision outside of the law. However, I have an example for you from the 1970s, which had a great influence on information ethics. So Robert Houtman conducted an experiment in 1975 when he visited 13 libraries and requested from the reference librarian information on how to create a bomb capable of destroying a suburban home. And all 13 libraries responded with the information requested. So this was Houtman's first foray into information ethics and he became quite a mainstay of the field, writing several books on the topic over the years. But it's a controversial case because ultimately the information that the libraries provided was perfectly legal. It was from chemistry books. But equally, you know, it was information that was damaging to society potentially. Now, Houtman's always acknowledged that information ethics was dynamic and complex. But the ethical issues faced could be straightforwardly reduced to two diametrically opposed positions, and I think these are important to understand. The first is that the information professional should never allow their personal beliefs to interfere with their responsibilities in information provision. And the second is that in providing access to information, we have an ethical responsibility to ensure that the information provided is not in any way dangerous to the individual or to society. Now, these two positions absolutely highlight the tensions for libraries. On one hand, our personal beliefs should not interfere with responsibility, but equally there are some areas in terms of societal safety, in terms of societal cohesion, where the librarian may have pause to decide whether to purchase something for the library or restrict access in other ways. Then these two points really, if you understand these, then you understand the dilemmas in information ethics as they relate to freedom of expression. Which moves us on to the topic of selection and censorship. Now, censorship is not a positive word. It's clearly a word that's often perceived pejoratively in many people's minds, as it relates to restricting access to something someone else does not want others to see. The American Library Association defines censorship as limiting or removing access to words, images, or ideas. The decision to restrict or deny access is made by a governing authority. This could be a person, group, or organization or business. Mali has suggested that censorship is a recurring problem in libraries, and there is no issue in librarianship, which is more likely to bring libraries onto the pages of the press, frequently in a damaging and trivial representation of the library profession. While acknowledging press obsessions with such stories as largely related to sensationalism and titillation, 
It's also not difficult to agree with him when he concludes that more can be done and should be done to avoid the negative image of the profession that emerges with each story. And you will probably have seen lots of stories in recent years on different aspects of censorship in libraries or challenges to library resources or events and the like. And quite often the headlines are potentially damaging from an advocacy perspective for libraries. For example, at the time of recording this video, an article appeared in The Telegraph highlighting what the author of the piece perceived to be restrictions on access in some libraries to materials that were deemed to be offensive to LGBTIQ plus library users, despite the legality and potential popularity within the wider community. Now, such stories can be damaging for libraries if they're seen to be restrictive in terms of the use. So it's one of these issues where librarians have to be aware of the potential consequences of following advice that perhaps might be from one side of the fence when other sides of the fence are essentially arguing with that position. Now a seminal article on censorship versus selection was published in 1953 by Lester Ashine, and even to this day it provides pause for thought as to regards the role of the librarian in such matters. He said the real question of censorship versus selection arises when the librarian, exercising his own judgment, decides against the book which has every legal right to representation on his shelves. In other words, we should not have been concerned with a librarian who refused to buy Ulysses for his library before 1933, because it was illegal in America before then. But we do have an interest in his refusal after the courts cleared it for general circulation in the United States. So again, reinforcing this point, this insults framework, that legal basis is really what should prompt and trump any issues when it comes to libraries. He goes on to argue that there is a very real, da real danger, almost impossible to combat, that the point of view with which the reader is in agreement will seem to be more sincerely held than one with which he disagrees. When a book attacks a basic belief or a way of life to which we are emotionally attached, its purpose will seem to us to be vicious rather than constructive dangerous rather than valuable, deserving of suppression rather than of widespread dissemination. Now again, I think this paragraph is really important. It gets to the heart of censorship dilemmas in the modern era. This was written 70 years ago, but equally it could be written today with the same effect. So this personal aspect of what we might view as to be offensive is something that certainly has to be considered from the point of view of library provision. But equally, it's something we also have to be very wary of because our viewpoint is not necessarily the viewpoint of the rest of our users and it also might be something that we are biased about in some way. So it is, it's a constant dilemma. It's not an easy thing to resolve, but it's something we always have to be aware of. Now, Ashheim in summary. So Jones summarised Ashheim's paper quite well in three key points here. So I'll summarise these. The selector views the work in its entirety and is able to assess the appropriateness of the inclusion of each of its elements within the context of the entire work. The selector seeks to expand the intellectual possibilities for the users of the library. The censor always seeks to limit them. The selector expresses implicit belief in the intelligence of the library's clientele and in its potential for growth through the experiences provided by library materials. The censor is fearful that readers lack intelligence judgment and virtue. The censor is elitist. The selector knows that the provision of many intellectual options is the only appropriate behaviour in a democratic environment. So this tension between selection and censorship is one that will always be with us, but it's something, again, try to err on the side of being a selector rather than a censor. Even if you think your reasons for perhaps limiting materials are good, make sure that they have been thoroughly tested before you do so. We must always be careful not to cross the line between selector and censor, and the line is not always easy to gauge, especially when multiple groups in society are vying for libraries to represent their values and exclude the values of those they oppose. Gorman summarises as such. It is the censors who insist on po in imposing their values, not the believers in intellectual freedom. The distinction lies right there. The point at which beliefs become rancid is when they are imposed on others, something common to fundamentalists of all stripes. Now this leads us to discuss censorship challenges briefly. In 1960, John F. Kennedy stated that libraries should be open to all except a censor. So obviously censors are 
always there for libraries. People wish to limit access, as we've discussed already. And the ALA defines it as such, censors pressure public institutions, like libraries, to suppress and remove from public access information they judge inappropriate or dangerous, so that no one else has a chance to read or view the material and make up their own minds about it. The censor wants to prejudge materials for everyone. So again, it's this notion of control over content, whether it's librarian being the censor or whether they're listening to people in the wider society to be censors, they also have to be aware that such challenges are problematic for libraries. And this is not a new thing. Ashheim's article was from 1953, but as far as back as 1975, Censorship of libraries was deemed a significant aspect of the total area of censorship in the UK. And censorship of library collections is a particular concern for society, as, as Hauptmann says, it prescribes an a priori limitation on specific materials based on spe specious reasoning, religious or ideological persuasion, or emotional reaction. And bang up to date, in a July 2022 survey conducted by Sillip, more than 80% of librarians were concerned about a perceived increase in incidences of challenges to intellectual freedom, such as requests to remove titles that address specific identities, and a third claimed that they had been asked to censor materials directly. That's a significant problem that's a contemporary situation, but as I say, it's not something that's new. We can look back to previous discussions of this topic in terms of how they handled it and learn from that. Now, some examples you'll be aware of of how censorship manifests, but just a reminder. Obviously, complaints about specific library resources or themes or broad categories of materials that libraries provide access to. Or complaints about library events. More recently, drag queen story hours have had massive complaints in libraries. And also challenges to how materials are organised and displayed in libraries. I'm not, I haven't focused on that too much today because it's going to be part of the next video. But the, the idea of how libraries organise material and how they display it to users is very contentious and is also an aspect of censorship as well. And ways to approach, well, clear stock development policies are absolutely important. If you can point to a policy for the reason why that you take some material and not others, that could be a huge defence for you. Clear mission statements that tell users what you see your role as. A link to that is an understanding of the populations that you actually serve. Another important aspect is considering all complaints or challenges in light of library policies, SELP's ethical framework and the rights of library users. And lastly, and this is very important, being aware that on occasion mistakes can happen in terms of buying library materials. It's not uncommon for the wrong material to be provided for the wrong age group, for instance. These mistakes can happen, apologise, move on, but they're not the heart of censorship challenges. But it's important that we don't get defensive about such mistakes. When they do happen, we address them and use the appropriate mechanism for perhaps moving an item if it's not age appropriate and the like. But these mistakes can happen and to defend them often can undermine our overall approach to censorship more broadly. So in summary, we've discussed freedom of access and freedom of expression as concepts. We've considered some of the arguments for and against the right to access controversial information. And we've also considered examples from libraries where the tensions inherent in these rights can cause ethical dilemmas. And in the next video, we're going to focus on the ethics of information organisation. We will also discuss some aspects, as I said earlier, of issues like how we organise information and how we classify information and display information that may also lead to complaints and potential censorship challenges as well.